Have you ever gone really wild? Dropping raspberry pies to poles in Antarctica, and I have been known to stick them on sea turtles as well. Using technology to connect our students with frontiers and settings that would otherwise be beyond them. They share with us what they've captured. They were so excited. It was just amazing. Welcome to Hello World, a podcast for educators interested in computing and digital making. I'm Carrie-Anne Philbin, a computing educator, content creator, YouTuber and nature nurturer. And I'm James Robinson, a computing educator, and I currently work on projects promoting effective pedagogy within our subject. If you want to support our show, then subscribe whenever you get your podcast and leave us a five star review. Today, we are reconnecting with nature as we explore ways to bring the outside into our computing classrooms. Not always the most obvious marriage, technology and nature. I mean, electronic devices don't always like our weather, particularly here in the UK. However, technology can help environmentalists learn more about our planet and the creatures that inhabit it. And as we've learned from previous episodes, context can play an important role in inspiring our students. So, James, Have you ever gone really wild with a computing project? (laughs) Yeah, I I think nature's a really interesting context. I think it's something that's so, you know, we're so all sort of naturally connected to and really really tangible sort of context to work in. But it is one that I've I've, I've often struggled to bring into my classroom and my learning spaces. But I think just a couple of things that I have tried, I I really enjoy doing sort of time-lapse photography, sort of automated time-lapse. And that's a great thing to do, whether that be with with plants or with other creatures i think what's really nice there is that you can sort of see and visualize and capture processes that otherwise happen so slowly that you wouldn't be able to observe them as a, you know <laughs> just sitting there watching i vividly remember a time when we first started to work together where we decided to do a time lapse of cress growing inside little eggshells and we even like drew little faces on them and we named them James and Carrie Ann and you failed to water yours and I made sure mine lived (laughs) and there is a really good time lapse that happens really fast across 30 seconds where you just see mine grow and yours grow and then die. (laughs) Well I was going for like accuracy right you know you've got a lot a lot longer hair mine's gradually uh, disappearing so I was going for accuracy um but yeah and I've done the same kind of experiment with my uh, actually my, my own children at home we we um grew some tomato, tomato plants and um captured the the video of those and then we were able to observe phototropism which is the process where plants gradually kind of angle themselves towards the light and grow towards it and that's something you can't really observe in, in a moment by moment kind of observation. So I think it's it's really it's a really interesting and important um, context. And the other end of that, in t- you know, in terms of being able to use technology, is we can use it to observe processes that where maybe the things we're observing are quite remote, or um, actually the, the processes that we're trying to observe are quite delicate, and a human presence there would actually be quite disruptive. So we can use technology to have a a kind of a, a physical presence, an observation sort of space, but without us kind of being there. I really think it's really important for our young learners. We mentioned context just a moment ago. You know, this is just yet another really important context where we can offer some uh, variety and diversity of experiences to our students of computing. And I think also it's particularly relevant now as the young people that we are educating now, there are so many sort of relevant and important real world challenges that are both pressing and interesting and engaging and very solvable and uh, by t- with, with the use of technology. So I think it's a really important context for our for our learners. You've kind of often struck me, you, you do lots of crafts and things, you often struck me as a bit of an indoorsy kind of person, Carrie Ann. Um, have, what have you ever done to connect uh, computing with nature in, in your own experience? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think you're being really kind there, James. I think what you're trying to say is that I'm not very green fingered and I'm perhaps, you know, more tended to find me in hotels rather than in, <laughs> um, you know, camping. <laughs> I think is what we're saying is I'm probably not quite as outdoorsy as I probably should be. But I am a human being of a generation that is conscious of the impact they're having on the world around them and on the environment and on the wildlife that lives on our planet with us. I grew up in a very urban environment and this is going to be quite the newsflash for you all but when I moved to the countryside it turns out there is more wildlife and more diversity of species of wildlife (laughs) in the countryside. Who knew? 
who knew? I feel like I've discovered something there and I'm sharing it with you all. But what I mean by that is I am more aware of the, the animals and the wildlife that's in my locality. And that is having an impact on how I perhaps do my gardening or how I create an environment that's not just suitable for me, but is also suitable for the wildlife that clearly wants to, to live alongside us, whether that's in the planting that I put in my garden or the spaces that I create for that, um, for, for that wildlife to bed in and, and, and live. So, for example, we have a lot of birds that come into our garden and every year, year on year, like the number of nesting birds in my garden is just crazy. As soon as one nest vacates, another either group of birds move in or maybe it's the same, you know, I'm just not knowledgeable enough to know but if I start using technology to track that a little bit better maybe I would be much more knowledgeable about what that wildlife needs to thrive in that environment and what more I could be doing to support it and one of the really big mind-blowing moments for me was kind of last year I woke up in the night and I went downstairs to my kitchen to get a drink in the middle of the night and we've got um, a security camera in our garden that goes off when motion is detected and quite often it can go off, just anything sets it off, you know, a tree moving, kind of whatever. So I went downstairs, get a drink in the dark, and suddenly the security light went off. So it was like, oh no, intruder alert, intruder alert. And I looked outside the window and there was the most beautiful hedgehog you've ever seen just rumbling around in my garden, uh, heading for the bug hotel. So sorry, uh, insects, but um, I think I think you were you were on course to be dinner. Um, but for me, I've never seen a wild hedgehog. You know, for me, that was sort of mind blowing. You know, I told my mum about it and she was just like, oh, my God, that's amazing. But, you know, that sent me on a journey about what was it about the habitat that meant that the hedgehogs were coming into my garden? What could I be doing to support that better? What little spaces could I create to kind of encourage that? Was it unusual? Actually, should I be worried about that hedgehog and, and and should I be contacting someone to to make sure that hedgehogs are right if I had set up some technology because I'm not awake in the night like you said James earlier on I could be finding out more about the life cycle of that hedgehog right I think that's really interesting as well I, I was reading a thing recently about how as humans are spread across the, the world you know it's not just that we inhabit areas but we actually we break up like we we demark the land and so actually we're kind of creating barriers between different species that interact normally and so you you see the species diminish in that area um and and the sort of the variety of of nature kind of you know just dwindles a little bit because there, there are these sort of human barriers between um, their, their interactions well maybe we're more adventurous and more knowledgeable maybe about this topic than we've given ourselves credit <laughs> for i think we're about to find out i mean when i think about technology in the wild I immediately think of our first guest an active conservationist and technologist who I met many years ago when he started strapping raspberry pies to poles in Antarctica to conduct field research so welcome technical director of the Arabada initiative co-founder of Nature Bite Shuttleworth Foundation fellow and good friend to the Raspberry Pi Foundation Alistair Davies welcome thank you for joining us what is a conservation technologist sounds like the best job title in the world and what do you do? Well, welcome. Thank you very much. A conservation technologist is a really exciting job to have because your goal really is to help scientists solve their problems. And as, as you were saying moments ago, that is often around understanding behaviour of animals, um, using various sensors to understand environmental change over time. And what's exciting for me is I spent about 11 years at ZSL London Zoo doing just that. And you're right, I was strapping raspberry pies to poles in Antarctica. And I have been known to stick them on sea turtles as well um, and use the camera to look at behaviour. And for me, it's been really exciting because I have, I think, merged the boundary between how scientists observe the world and how you get that into the classroom. So it's quite exciting for me today to be here with you to kind of share some tips on what that has been like for me. So what first inspired you to become involved in conservation? When I was growing up, uh, about 18, 19 years old, um, I went interrailing. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of uh, what, you know interrailing, but that was... That, you know, yeah, you know. that's a generational thing right there. <laughs> yeah, it's like that was the thing to do. You get your ticket, you know, the golden ticket, and you, you hit the rails and off you went. And um, 
when I did that, it was quite eye opening to just the change in the world today. So the beaches I was visiting in, say, Barcelona, there was little flecks of different colours on the sand, which are, are now very you know well known as microplastics. Whereas back then, it was something that was really just you know bubbling up to the surface. Uh, my trips abroad to rainforests. Once you're in that world, in that zone, and you've experienced that, I think it's so captivating. You want to do what you can to help conserve it, share it for you know other generations, um, and as a kind of um, electrical engineer as well and interested in computing I merged the two worlds together and crafted this this term conservation technologist but um there's been a real push over the last few years looking at how this drive in low-cost electronics um and access can really make a difference you know what we're doing today was hard to do 10 years ago but with the advent of like pico and all these really low-cost microcontrollers and the pi itself there's been so much we can do in this world to really understand the environment. Um, and that's, that's what I've been doing, just harnessing that, that access to those electronics and repurposing them for conservation goals. And how has technology impacted the field more generally in conservation? Oh, it's been massive. Um, I would say, for example, this is bubbling up too, but tiny ML, so tiny machine learning. That's where you're teaching um, essentially the computer to look for specific objects. So let's say a polar bear. It's a project I'm working on at the minute where we're using thermal cameras to detect the silhouette of polar bears. We're teaching the camera, which will be a Raspberry Pi 4, exactly what a polar bear looks like in thermal vision, training that model and doing it all on the chip, all on the computer itself. And if you think about how you can take something exciting as working with a polar bear and place it in the classroom, you can retrain that to detect people. You can have it as a person detector, someone walking in and out of the room. You can put it in your garden and look for foxes by training it to look for silhouettes of foxes. Or you could even find that wonderful hedgehog that you spotted and you could teach your Raspberry Pi to detect it in thermal vision. So that just just shows you kind of like what we're doing in the conservation world. I'm super interested. You've piqued my interest now. (laughs) I've got Project Envy. (laughs) I mean, it sounds uh, amazing. Are there any specific projects that you've worked on? You talked a bit about the turtles and strapping, you know, thing devices to turtles. It would be great to kind of hear some of those stories uh, for our teachers to be able to to understand this kind of this this world, this landscape a bit more. What I do um, on a day to day basis is correspond with a an after school computing club that which uh, Arabada set up on a, a West African island called Principe. It's a population of only you know, a few thousand people. Um, and after school, the local kids go down to the club and we give them free access to computing and education STEM activities. And what I have found fascinating, and I really hope this will kind of become uh, more apparent in the classroom, is with the opportunity now to stream content or create podcasts and access to Internet, things like Starlink that are coming up, you know, Fastnet from anywhere. We've been linking the classroom in Principe to classrooms abroad and having the kids exchange activities and what's become apparent in nature conservation is that you then have access to this faraway island you know this land where you can't get to physically becomes open to innovation so you can have children decide how to build a time-lapse camera in um, Peckham share their insights with the kids in Principe the kids in Principe build it put it out on the island share their results and the kids in Peckham get to see these fantastic species. Um, And when I started in this world, we weren't really doing that. We were still going to the school garden or taking kits home, which is still fascinating and great to get involved in. So you get those, you know, the the native species, which is still eye opening. But I think with that, what's next question to really excite the kids, um, it's saying, hey, let's do another Skype call because we're going to see what your camera's got. And that, to me, is a new boundary in what future activities could look like. We've been experimenting with it at the minute, so just dabbling in it. We've done a few links up with various zoos and so on. There's always a language barrier issue that we have to break down. Um, but again, even through you know through language, there's really great translation services now. You can get videos. Um, you can run them through you know Google Voice or whatever. Um, and we can just really push the boundaries there and say, well, why can't we link a school classroom in the Arctic to a school classroom in Norwich. And we can. So I really hope we do more of that moving forwards and try to share these nature experiments uh, in that way. 
I think it kind of goes back to what you were talking about with your interrailing experience. It's almost like being able to take young people who perhaps can't, you know, don't have access to the funds to be able to travel around the world, but can still find ways to connect them with the environments and the people of, of, of those other countries and vice versa, I guess. Yeah, definitely. And the excitement from sharing the content is key. Right. If you can put up some really captivating content, even before you engage your, your class in the, in the making part of it, I think it reinforces the fact that it's worth putting the energy in to do. So say you've had you know, a really long school day, you then get stuck into an activity, something goes wrong, someone's having you know trouble getting their code running or they've put their jumper cables on back to front, you haven't spotted it, and they're a little bit kind of disillusioned. Starting the day off with, here's what, here's what scientists do with the same hardware you're touching is key. Um, and one really nice story I can share with you, which is a, a world exclusive Ooh. coming Ooh. to a Raspberry Pi blog shortly, is in 2018 before the world changed (laughs) pre-pandemic when everything was normal as we called it I was lucky enough to travel to Antarctica like you said but we stuck a new camera out it's a a new build we hadn't done it before and we put a Pi Zero inside so you know the cheapest most accessible one at the time it's pre-pico and everything (laughs) put a solar panel on it and we we ran it for what we thought would be a year so we thought it would run for a year and it was on a time-lapse uh rotation watching a over a penguin colony and a Delhi penguin colony. It was on the top of a volcano in Antarctica. It's very strange, but penguins like to light volcanoes in Antarctica. It's all a little bit warmer for them. But um, we put out for a year in 2018 and we thought we'd get it back in 2019. But the sea ice was too thick in 2019 for the boat to get access. So we, we lost the year. So it had to stay out for two years. And I was sitting thinking, oh my God, when are these things going to get through two Antarctic winters? So 2019 goes by, 2020 hits and the pandemic starts. So all the boats are cancelled, the whole world changes and our little camera is still out there on the ice. So we had to leave out there for three years. And then Tom, the penguinologist, which is a great job title. (laughs) I I didn't get told at school that you could become a penguinologist, but you can be. Um, he He got his hands on it last month and he brought it home. And it'd been out there for three and a half years on the ice, this little Raspberry Pi Zero in its little um, protective enclosure. And I, I popped it out, took the SD card out and took the brave moment of clicking the camera folder to see what it had saved. And it was sitting there for a while, like whirring away. Um, and I thought, oh, it's, it's, it's taking forever. It's going to be corrupt. Something's gone wrong here. And then it stopped and it said 27,614 photos. <laughs> Gosh, and that camera had taken a photo every hour for three and a half years. Oh, wow. A a Pi Zero. And I was like, oh, my goodness. (laughs) And the photos are absolutely stunning. It's like the most in-depth, private view of, of you know, the penguins world. Amazing data for the scientists. They've got sea ice in the background, so they can quantify how ice changed because they're worried about climate change on the peninsula. They've got the penguins leaving, coming back for three whole years, you know, seasonality. They can quantify sea ice movements as well. So it's all the data they ever dreamed of. And we did it with a Pi Zero. And if you take these photos of these penguins, like like National Geographic style photos, and put it in front of a, a, a class of children, amazingly captivating. And then you say, hey, you know that zero that was in this, this camera here? It's on your desk. Let's go make cameras. And they're so much more engaged because then they think, wow, I can do this. So... This will all be open access, so you can get access to the photos. It's going to go onto a citizen science site, so you can ID penguins. Um, that's what I want to see happen next. If more scientists can share their data in that way as well and get it into classrooms, we can really you know, captivate these young audiences and say, you can do this. Um, and I was just so happy that that famous Pi Zero ran for three and a half years on the ice. I mean, what a dream. They are really robust things and I mean, I have a similar story but i'm not going to go into it now but we recovered one after it was washed up through it came through the north sea and landed on a beach um and was sent back to us and again we had lots of photos from a high altitude balloon flight so they are very robust but i think i want to return to that point about about sort of using technology to connect our students with frontiers and contexts and settings that would otherwise be beyond them and I think that that's like back when I was doing I mean I've mentioned how to do ballooning and I won't go into that but one of the reasons for choosing a project like that was I was very literally expanding the horizons of those pupils and taking them to a place that they couldn't go 
with some very low cost and accessible technology. And I think that this is a similar kind of thing, right? You know, if we can connect them with these far flung remote sort of um, natural landscapes, then actually we can make those places more important, more relevant, more and make, make our students feel more connected to them. And I think that's a really important goal and something that we can we can do through technology. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm just in awe of, of these kind of projects. It's fantastic. And I would have to echo those thoughts, but but also just draw attention to the part about data and collecting data and making the the concepts of computer science relevant by showing these real world examples. So we've touched a bit there on data science and a little bit on machine learning. And you gave a really great example about how training a model can help help with conservation. And I and you're talking about those penguins and those photographs, and I was thinking about all the data you talked about, about the ice kind of moving and the, and the birds coming in and out, whether or not training a computer to do that statistical analysis was kind of part of that journey. And I just think all these things just really bring computer science to life and away from just binary <laughs> or just, you know, what's a neural network? It kind of really um, provides a the real world context, which we always say not every child is going to become a software engineer by learning computer science but every young person they may go into all of these different worlds these different um, professions uh, these different passions that they have whether it be animals whether it be you know uh, high altitude ballooning whether it be uh, space and whatever these things are create creative pursuits Um, actually computer science can play a part in all of them yeah I think that's a really it's a really good point. And I think my my I think my kind of final question maybe for for Alistair, I'd be really interested. We've kind of alluded to it a couple of times, but what are the ways in which schools can get involved in the kinds of projects that you're doing? How can they get connect to the, the real science that's going out there, going on out there in the world? Yeah, it's a really good question because often you ask, where do you go? You know, where where's the portal to this world? I think what what I'd like to suggest first is that the citizen science aspect of it. There are a lot of good citizen science projects where you can just open your browser and have a very easy 30 minute session with your school class and take them to a Zooniverse where they can engage with the Penguin project or they can look at other scientific projects. And that first introduces them to data, as you said, that data is useful, data is used in science, but it can be fun because lots of these activities are kind of point and click. You know, can you identify an object in there? And that then is the bridge to what machine learning does for us. So, okay, this has taken you an hour to look at 20 photos. What's next? Um, Another great great website is um, Instant Wild, which is a ZSL project where you get some live photos and you can ID the species there. And that's a really good one to just have a look because they've got a lot of cameras globally. And then moving forwards, the next step, I think, it's something that, that you touched on a moment ago, but... When we introduce these young minds to computing, I too believe that not everybody wants to be a hardware engineer. Not everyone wants to be a software engineer. There are a lot of students who just love working with data and presenting. So if you can actually get them stats and they can draw up their own PowerPoints and do their own charts and actually explain what's going on with the data, it's just as you know impactful than you having to get into Python code or muck around in Scratch or anything else. Um, so the activities that I've seen recently that have been a little bit more accessible, especially for the younger minds, have been the ones where we've said, here's some tracking data from sea turtles, the GPS telemetry data. You tell us what you think this turtle's doing, but we don't give anything away. We just give them the Excel spreadsheet with the GPS lat and long. And then they go and they have to actually look at the lat and long and figure out how it even works. Like, what am I doing here? And they map it and say Google Earth and they come up with, oh, look, here's a map. And then they'll get a boundary every day of where these turtles have been. And that then gets them into the world of, oh, what's a marine protected area? How are you going to protect your turtle? And then they they, they will map themselves, like, you know, geo boundary in boxes. And those baby steps are great because when you then say to them, here's what's next, we're going to look at putting a camera on a sea turtle. You can make your own cam. Again, they want to get engaged because they now, they're now you know, connected to the life of this sea turtle. That kind of data is already accessible for activities on the Raspberry Pi website. There's, there's one which you can look at real data, which I provided of a sea turtle in Guinea-Bissau going about its life. Um, I'm sure we can share it um, connected to this podcast. Have a look at that. Run that activity with your school class. Start with the basic data and stats. You don't even have to touch the hardware and then progress into the more maker university world of what can we do 
uh, and put it in our garden. From today, that's my kind of tip to say, try it. I've, I've seen it work and there's a lot of interest to do that. That's really interesting and, and some great tips there. Thank you very much, Alistair. Our next guest is well on her way to creating the next generation of conservation technologists. Natalie Shersby is a prolific computer club volunteer running code clubs in schools for the past three years and a coder dojo in a community library. She has been experimenting with household items and affordable electronics components to make a motion sensitive Raspberry Pi powered DIY wildlife camera with her Coda Dojo, an activity which she shares in issue 16 of Hello World. Welcome, Natalie. What made you want to bring the outside into your computing club? Hi, Carrie Anne. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction there. Um, so, really, um, we were about, I'd say, sort of six months into our Coda Dojo, and the kids were all getting into like a good swing with things. And but it was coming up to that sort of the six week break in the summer holidays. And I thought, I don't really want to break this off because they're all getting into a good swing. And I know for, um, with my daughter, if, if she's like she's got her gymnastics and things, I know she doesn't really like it over the summer because it stops. And I'm thinking, right, I'm, I'm going to need to put something on in the summer. I want to put something on in the summer. So I kind of thought well what can what can we do that is sort of summer oriented so we'd already made a wildlife camera my daughter and I and it was brilliant she was really engaged the photos that were collected we were there for hours looking at all these photos and she just she found it fantastic she loved building the camera so I thought that's a really good one that's going to transfer really well to our Coda Dojos so we so we got all the the kit together um and and we advertised the sessions and there were so many kids that wanted to come along and have a go so we did it over a, over a series of about 3 or 4 weeks in the summertime so it was a small group to start with and then they'd they'd come they'd build the camera they'd take it home for a week they'd come back they'd share with us what they'd captured etc and it was just amazing did this interest come from from you? Have you got a personal kind of interest in conservation and wildlife, or is it just did it kind of spin out of this activity you did with your daughter? Where did that inspiration kind of come from? So it was it was mainly my, my daughter loves animals. We we sort of we go to the Yorkshire Wildlife Park all the time. She loves it there, and so we just we were sort of trying to think of things that we could both do together um, to get her a bit more into the technology stuff because she's she's sort of more arty minded creative but I thought well what can we do that's a little bit more creative as well as the technology side having had that sort of the feedback from her and her enjoyment of doing the project I thought it's going to trans- translate really well to the children at the the Coda Dojo. You had a, a, a sort of a a nice guinea pig to help you out with the activity first I know all the sort of technical <laughs> challenges and then how, how old were the students or the the, the the children that were attending the kind of what kind of group so they ranged from sort of around seven to about 14 mainly sort of primary school age but there were a couple that were a little bit older than that at secondary school and which bits of the project were they doing so you mentioned they, they built the camera was, was there kind of some programming involved for them I'm, I'm just interested in that kind of their journey through the project all, all the com- components were were sort of laid out in front of them they had a little kit and so we went first of all we were sort of like we went through what all the different bits and pieces were it was really for, for a lot of them it was the first time that they'd ever really seen the component parts for different things we used Raspberry Pi Zero boards so we showed them just how, how small it was and how powerful it could be. And we all, all together, we all sort of did it in a big group. We all did each stage together so that if anyone got stuck or anything, it, it was fine. Everyone was together doing it all. And so we built built the machine together and got all the parts. I'd already pre-drilled the holes in, in the little plastic box for them and, and all that sort of stuff. And um, then it was a case of uh, we just we used some software. We actually used the My Nature Watch camera kits, and so the software was already there for us to download. So we'd already d- downloaded that, and I showed them how to put it onto the SD card, etc. So they did all that. Then and then we just sort of loaded it up and everything, and away they went. So at first, first of all, they were they were trying to capture each other on the camera. <laughs> of course. <laughs> And uh, and then 
so then they could take it home and and they had it for about a week and they put it in their own gardens and and then they came back and they showed us what they what they were able to capture what what kind of animals or what kind of creatures were they able to capture in that time there was mainly birds cats squirrels Mm -hmm. Um, somebody got a mouse, a, li- a little field mouse, and their own pets, their own their own oh. cats. We had um, a couple of ducks. So yeah. And what kind of impact did you see on on the on the pupils themselves? How did they find the project? Were, did, were they coming back keen to kind of show what they captured? Like, what was the kind of the impact on 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 the on the kids that were in your? Yeah, they were they were really engaged, and uh, as I said before, it was the first time some of them had really ever seen like component parts and actually built something. So they got um, a real special sense of achievement out of building that functioning device, and were able to get the use from that. But and they were so excited um, to show the group the different animals that they captured. Um, some of them even took the cameras to like their grandparents' houses and like other friends' houses and and sort of snuck around and like hid the cameras here, there and everywhere and were like sort of, oh, what's going to be in your garden? Oh, I wonder if you'll have something different to me. And and even the grandparents got in on it on it. And um, a few weeks later, I got some messages. They, they, weren't, they, they didn't count as nature, <laughs> did they? They weren't the subject of the, of the, of the no. footage. <laughs> So even the and the grandparents were like, oh, this is this is really good. And I got actually some messages off the parents asking, well, where do we get these things from? We want to have a go. So it was like it, it seemed to really appeal to people of all ages. And um, it was just it seemed to, to sort of really extend extend out to the families and the friends as well. Um, but when they came back in and um, were showing the, the things that they'd found, we, we had this wonderful conversation in which we all discussed what other sort of outdoor nature-based projects that they might like to build or to make or what they might like to do. And sort of the suggestions from the, the range from automatic plant watering devices to like weather stations. And um, even one of them had a garden, big garden pond and wanted to make an automatic fish feeder for their pond. So it really, it, it sort of got the creative juices flowing and they're all like, oh, what, what they'd like to do next. It, it was really, really, really inspiring. And what's interesting is that they're, they're all super, like, doable kind of projects, right? You know, often when you kind of pitch things to kids and you say, what do you want to make? And it's like, well, I want to make a, a jet-powered backpack. You know, it's often a little bit outlandish, but they are very, very practical, doable, interesting projects. What tips do you have for teachers or club leaders to help them get started with a project like this? For tips, I would say it's important that you have fun with it. Um, you can always start small, gain a bit of confidence and work up to the, some bigger projects. Um, definitely include the learners in the discussions about what they might be interested to build because I feel that if they're interested in the, in the thing that they're going to make, it's all the better for it. Um, I don't think necessarily you'd have to start with a project like this. There are lots of other activities that they could do to get out there and to reconnect with nature. One of the things being, I think um, Alistair touched on it a bit earlier about the machine learning aspect. There are these these like plant, different plant identifier apps now that you can get. So, you know, even for just taking a group of of young people out outdoors with an with a tablet with the the plant identifier app on it and just get them to you know all go and snap something that they think looks good or is an interesting plant and then they can find out what it is and just you know and then even just grab all of that data and, and get it into some spreadsheets or stuff stuff like that it's 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 all a good learning experience yeah and they could take photographs as well of the um the plants outside and they could train a model like um, using google teachable machine uh, is the one you can use images on that and they can actually train it to identify the plants they could build their own version of that app right which is super inspiring i think there's um there's some um, scouts um based activities that have a similar kind of feel where you're where where you're going out and you're taking they're, they're on the raspberry pi website you can go out and you're looking to identify plant leads and so on and it kind of takes a fairly want an algorithmic approach but it's kind of exposing some computing kind of um, principles that are sort of going on there as, as we identify and classify things so there's lots of yeah it's great great shout lots of great activities that don't necessarily require technology 
And we asked our listeners the same question. Have you ever conducted outdoor nature technology projects with your classroom or with your clubs? Uh, and what did you learn about them? And I really like this comment from um, Sashi Krishna, um, who uh, talked about a project that they, they did with some older students for Earth Week. They um, went away and they, they collected some data sets on CO2 emissions and they discussed endangered wildlife from local regions. And this was done with some um, international baccalaureate computing students. They built some interactive data dashboards and used them to sort of make analyses and, and, and develop findings. And uh, his reflection or, uh, was that cleaning up the data was the hardest part for the kids. Um, and uh, the next time they want to investigate how students can get their own data for their countries and, and local regions. And Alan O'Donoghue, our uh, insider guide teacher from Hello World, said that with year eight classes, they created and programmed virtual fish that swam in a tank using Scratch. And if you fed the fish correctly, created the right environment for them, then they swam around in random ways and displayed patterns. Uh, if you fed them too much, they didn't swim as well. And I like this, uh, this idea for a, a very makery kind of project from uh, Jackie Tan, um, who... Um, this is a, a project that they've got planned for next year. They're going to sew a plant pot out of landscape fabric, put a yogurt pot with seeds in, make an auto watering machine and monitor the progress of the plant over a period of time. I think that's a really nice kind of combination of different skills there, all kind of themed around nature. It's a great project. If you have a question for us or a comment about our discussion today, then you can email via podcast at helloworld.cc or you can tweet us at helloworld underscore edu. My thanks to Natalie and Alistair for sharing their expertise with us today. Really inspiring stuff. You can read Alistair's article, Reconnecting with Nature in Your Classroom, and Natalie's Discovering Wildlife with My Nature Watch Activities in issue 15 of Hello World magazine. So what did we learn, James? Well, apart from penguinologist as my f new future sort of uh, backup career, potentially, um, I thought it was really interesting to hear about all the different kind of ways that we can engage in nature and the importance of it for our pupils. Um, I found that really fascinating. How about you? Well, I'm just really glad that two of my favourite things at the moment, so one is kind of nature in my garden and the other one is machine learning, which I'm super interested in at the moment, can be combined together uh, in such a great way. I'm going to get on that hedgehog thing, like, right now. <laughs> <laughs>